Now let's get into ionization energy. Ionization energy is the energy required for an element in the gaseous state to lose an electron. So if we're looking at an example here, we could show it as, you know, sodium, you know, in that gaseous state going to sodium plus one and then, and then losing um, an electron. Right. Um, so, so that's the idea with with ionization energy. It's basically the energy required. I think it's an important piece of this to to realize that it's energy required for an element to to lose an electron. Um, ionization energies are sequential. You know, as it becomes basically harder to lose an electron, um, after the atom becomes positive. or, you know, a cationic uh, species. So, if we're trying to get to plus two, we couldn't just lose them all at once. We have to be sequential about it. And so, um, for um, sodium plus one above, um, we have a, an ionization energy equal here to 496 kilojoules um, per mole. But we might want to call that ionization energy one because we could go to the next level in terms of charge. But now, you know, there's going to be another energy um, associated with that. Because now you're not trying to lose an electron from sodium. You're trying to lose it from sodium that's plus one. And you see the big difference in the amount of energy that you have to supply in order for that process to um, occur. Where you'd have you know 496 kilojoules per mole for the first electron. But now um, we see that skyrockets to 4,560 to lose the actual second electron. So we can say as, you know, kind of a rule here is that it becomes harder to lose electrons after you've lost the first one. So the ionization energy for the first electron is going to be less than the ionization energy for the second electron, um, et cetera, as we go through. Um, also, something to note um, is that, you know, the, uh, the largest um, ionization energies observed are for elements leaving the noble gas electronic configuration.
which is what we're seeing here for the sodium. The sodium has a huge amount of energy to go from plus one to plus two because the sodium plus one right now is in its noble gas electronic configuration. So we have very significant increases in ionization energy if we're talking about an element, it's ion that's isoelectronic with a noble gas, and now we're trying to make it lose an extra electron. In terms of the trend that we see, we see it's going to mimic this idea of Z effective. Well, we're going to have ionization um, increasing from left to right. and increasing from bottom to top. And that's just a reflection on Z effective, right? That, you know, the higher the Z effective, the harder it is to remove an electron. You know, the larger the Z effective is, the greater they hold the atom's nucleus has on the valence electrons. So the harder it is for them to be lost. So that's the, the notion with, with Z effective and our idea of ionization energy. That if we have a very large Z effective, we have elements that don't want to lose electrons. And that goes back to that earlier periodic table that we have with the Z effective of showing, you know, one half of the periodic table, namely the right half, you know, wanting to gain electrons while the left half wanted to lose electrons and so that's being shown here that the elements that like to lose electrons are actually on the left side of the periodic table because they have the lowest ionization energy it's the easiest for them to actually ionize while the ones on the right it's much much more difficult to actually do that same process so we can see that idea of reactivity by you know, getting into um, a demo here of looking at, you know, lithium, sodium, um, potassium, I think we get to cesium, I think we skip rubidium, um, and then francium. Well, these are all in group, you know, 1A. And they all like to lose electrons. You know, and all, you know, have, you know, reasonable um, ionization energies. You know, however... Some ionize much easier. Which do you think? Right. So check out uh, you know the demo here that comes that's coming up, and we can have some fun with it. It's a couple of different videos that are spliced together, um, but it runs through. I think that that lowdown that we have here. I might be confusing cesium with rubidium, but um, uh, we'll talk about it after the video. Let me know what you think.
molecules of rubidium will only react when our specially designed vial dissolves in the water, which gives John a few crucial seconds to get into our safety zone. Cesium sinks in the water, the rapid generation of hydrogen gas should produce quite an explosion. And it does. So I hope you enjoyed those, um, especially the last one, which is kind of takes me back to my college days where I'd somehow procure some sodium and just, you know, take it down to the, the lake by our, our house, our house that we rented and, and have some fun throwing it into the lake and having some explosions. But um, <laughs> be careful with your chemistry. Um, but as we could see through the reactivity here, that, you know, lithium was, you know, the least reactive, right? It just kind of fizzled. While the francium was huge, right? Um, in terms of the explosion, in terms of reactivity, and that has to do with the idea of ionization energies. Um, you know, lithium has a much larger ionization energy. Right? It's further up on the periodic table. So it is less, you know, reactive compared, you know, to, let's say, francium, which is much, you know, further down on the periodic table. You know, which uh, ionizes easily. and allows for some of that fun explosive chemistry to actually happen. So that's the idea of ionization energy in terms of, of the just the trend. Um, let's get into um, exceptions. And so we find that um, there are slight problem areas between full subshells 
and half full subshells. Again, that revolve around the notion of degenerate orbitals. So that's why we were talking about that earlier. And we can see that in terms of this picture chart here. Oh, I lost it. There it is. Where if we kind of zoom in on it here a little bit, starting from left to right, we start with basically hydrogen, and then we're way up the top at helium here. And notice that there's a huge drop, right? So that's going left to right, right? That ionization increases as we go left to right. And we see that with hydrogen up to helium. And then from lithium up to neon, we see the same thing that, you know, from left to right, in general, it increases in terms of ionization energy. And then there's, again, this huge drop. Same thing between sodium argon, left to right, see a good increase. But at this idea of the noble gas, notice that the noble gases at the end of each one are of the highest energy right remember these don't like to react and that's shown by the fact that they have the highest energies now there are a couple other spots that we have problems at and we can see that here right in the middle of each one of these blocks this kind of washes out at the end but if we we're to look at the pink, we're actually going between a half filled P set it is right around that location um, that we're looking at. So it seems to be a, a little bit of an issue with the half filled notion. And then we also see that with the S set, which we're seeing here with the first portion of that, that down portion. But again, it tends to, to wash out. I'm not too worried necessarily about the S set. And we see another kind of that, that drop occurring with the um, transition metals right in this area here. It's right in the middle. Again, when we see that in the first place, and this, everything on the right is kind of a washout. And basically follows, you know, the trend. So there's this couple problem pieces, and, and, and basically what it's talking about is the notion of these degenerate orbitals. And so it can become very hard to lose electrons, or harder than we would expect to, to lose electrons from these particular states. For instance, you know, any chemistry with the noble gases is difficult. You know, that is why their, you know, ionization energy is the largest. You know, for their level. In terms of the periodic table so that's what we see there but what about this then other idea now why is it so difficult remember that we have a completely full set 
of orbitals, right? That's that's the reason. The other glitch is again this half fold notion. Right, another area we got to be careful of is this half filled set. And that's the harder one. The neon, the noble gases is, is easy to think of, I think, as long as you keep this mind that noble gases are stable. They don't like to react. Um, so that's why the ionization energy is so large. But for the half full, well, this is the elements are they're more in the middle of the periodic table. So what's, what's the story there? And I think we should go to um, a, an example of that. by asking ourselves, you know, which has the, uh, has the greater ionization energy, um, nitrogen or oxygen? So if we were to utilize our trend, this seems like a no-brainer. We have nitrogen to the left of our oxygen, right? So we would predict you know that nitrogen has the greater of those two or I apologize I'm saying So we would predict that um, oxygen would have, you know, the greater ionization energy. Right? It's the furthest to the right, according to our trend of increasing ionization energy. So that's what we predict. However, You know, that prediction is incorrect because of half-filled degenerate orbitals and their stability. So that's what we have to to take to to heart here is that that you know the the trend works really well, but we got to be careful when we get into um, things that have a degenerate level to them as far as these degenerate orbitals. So let's expand on that with um, you know looking at nitrogen um, and just looking at you know its valence shell. Nitrogen looks like this in terms of its valence electrons. Um, 
while our carbon, I'm sorry, our oxygen would look like this in terms of its valence shell. Now we're looking to look at ionization energy, right? Or this is loss of an electron. So that means that we're going to now a positively charged element or a cation, meaning that our, our nitrogen now is plus one and our oxygen would be plus one. So now what do those electronic configurations look like? We see our nitrogen now has lost its one electron and we see that oxygen is done the same, but the configurations are slightly different. And therein lies, you know, why the trend doesn't work in this area of half-filled degenerate orbitals. So in the beginning, nitrogen, we have a stable state. This is half-full. If we go to the product side, right, now this is not as stable, right? It's not a half full state or half full degenerate state. If we look at our oxygen, we find that our you know, our coin is, is, is now on the other side of the, of, the, of the head, right? Meaning that we're now not as stable to begin with because so we don't have that degenerate state. But when oxygen loses an electron, now we are in a stable state with our half-full set of degenerate orbitals. So it takes more energy to bring, you know, the nitrogen out of the degenerate state. Then it takes for basically oxygen to enter the degenerate state. And that just simply has to do because the degenerate state is more stable. Right, and so that's the reason that we have it. So um, in terms of oxygen versus nitrogen, nitrogen has the greater ionization energy as a result. So you want to be wary in, in terms of, of those types of, of you know, areas, right? And that's always kind of right around the, the middle of the, the, the period or the middle of the, of the actual periodic um, table. There's also the catty corner effect. Again, we, we talked about that with atomic size as well. Um, and so, you know, for this effect, you know, the vertical um, winds.
And so here we would have, you know, the, the relationship um, with the catty quarter effect where we're further um, to the right, but then we're also, you know, further up, right? Because remember, with ionization energy, right, this um, increases up and to the right. of that periodic table. So here's where that dilemma is going to uh, happen, where you have something further up, something further to the right, and the vertical, again, is, is always going to win. So as an example, you know, we could say which has the um, largest ionization energy and we could say that that would be comparing oxygen sulfur phosphorus and chlorine so over to uh, bring that table in right so we can see where we're looking at here, so we have our, our oxygen at the top, right? We have our sulfur, which is right below. We have our chlorine off to the right, and then we have our phosphorus off to the left. So there is our, our area, and so that's again where we just want to you know predict using the trend. And so I would say, well, I have my oxygen, I have my sulfur, my chlorine, and my phosphorus. You know, what is my trend? Well, my trend in terms of ionization energy is increasing like this. So if I use that um, as my guide, I end up with one of these one of these two. So oxygen is further up, but chlorine is further right. And so remember vertical wins so oxygen has the greatest ionization energy so here we had the caddy corner effect occurring there so that is our notion of ionization energies. They increase as we go up and to the right across the periodic table. Um, things to worry about are the catty corner relationship we just talked about, um, but also this notion of do I have an element in this degenerate state? And then I have to be kind of be a little bit more wary of that degenerate state and, and take more precaution in answering. Next, we move on to electron affinity. The next tidbit that we need to get into is electron affinity. And electron affinity is basically the energy released upon an atom gaining an electron. in the gaseous state.
So we could look at, um, you know, um, chlorine turning into chloride. And so it would have to accept one electron um, in order to do that. And we find that our electron affinity here would be equal to negative 349 kilojoules per mole. So notice it's a negative value as opposed to a positive value. And, and that's the, the difference with, um, you know, whether it's being released in terms of energy or um, required in terms of energy. Energy that's positive is required. Energy that's negative is actually um, released. And so with electron affinity, um, it's, it's kind of the same um, regard uh, in, in, in a couple cases. You know, electron affinity um, is, you know, sequential. But it gets um, harder and harder to add. Um, electrons due to you know negative repulsive features you know of electrons right it's inherent to them so it's harder and harder to add electrons. Um, the trend that we have, you know, is it, it basically um, mimics the effective in terms, you know, of absolute value. So, you know, electron affinity increases in negative value from bottom to top and left to right. So if we look at our table We're getting, you know, a more negative electron affinity as we move from left to right, um, as well as going from bottom to top. And that just kind of mimics our increasing, you know, Z effective Right, that, you know, if it's a larger Z effective, well, it's actually going to have a more of an attractive force to gain an electron. And as a result of that greater attractive force, now we have more energy that's actually released to the surroundings. So... So that's the, the trend um, that, that we see with electron affinity. Again, we need to be wary, though, of the degenerate um, state. So... As an example of that, um, we could do kind of the same thing we did with nitrogen and oxygen, but let's just change up um, the other elements, um, nitrogen and, and carbon.
So we're asked here, you know, which has the most negative electron affinity, carbon or nitrogen? Um, and we see with these two, again, they're right beside each other. And we should be able to predict quite easily, you know, what's what. Here is our, our carbon atom, and then we have our nitrogen um, right beside it. So when we predict using the trend, you know, we would say that, well, I have carbon, I have nitrogen, and since my trend is increasing or getting more negative this way, right, then I would predict that nitrogen has, you know, the, the more negative electron affinity. You know, there's no caddy corner. So we don't have to worry about that. But another question we want to kind of keep asking in terms of maybe de de developing a method would be, um, you know, do I have an element, you know, in a degenerate state? And my answer to that is yes. So that's where I have to be careful. So if I look now at the two elements, first my nitrogen with the 2s and the 2p, and my carbon as well with the 2s and the 2p. And now I'm looking at electron affinity where now we're gaining an electron. Right now I'm just kind of looking at what am I generating after that. Here now we're generating the anion form of those elements. And now if I put in the electrons now that reside because of the gaining of one electron, I now end up with these electronic configurations. So we see something very similar that we saw to ionization energies where here We have a half full, you know, degenerate state. And that is stable. But now we don't. All right, so now it's not as stable. We've lost that half filled shell. In terms of carbon, it's the flip flop, right? We're actually starting with the non-degenerate state that's not as stable and now we're entering into a half full degenerate state or something that is more stable so since you know the carbon is entering a more stable state it will basically give off more energy again that's that idea of more negative energy it will give off more energy then for nitrogen, who 
who is basically leaving a more stable state. So you see it with that that notion of ionization energies, and we see it with that notion of electron affinities. That carbon is going to have the more negative electron affinity um, as a result. And, and we can see that in um, a couple of charts that I'll, I'll, I'll put here at the end. Um, a few of the other ones that we need to wrap up with. The fifth one is metallic character. Um, another way to think about it is, you know, electropositivity. Or, you know, the trend that is exactly the opposite to electronegativity. And if we have our table here, it's not much on metallic character, but we have our our trends, so this is one of them. Where here we have increasing metallic character, right? And we should think about that as, you know, positive, right? These are elements, how positive do they actually wanna, wanna be? And then six, one that we've already talked about is electro negativity or that you know elements desire to gain electrons and we see you know basically the exact opposite trend that we see above Z effective and electronegativity, you know, sound very much the same. So that's electronegativity. And then, and lastly, <clears throat> you know, just be aware of the degenerate states. <clears throat> when dealing you know with ionization energy and electron affinity and you know the reversals that occur So just to kind of bring that all back together here, um, the end, you know, the, the problem areas are right here. Right there's a degenerate state. Um, and another one that we find is right around here as well. You know, and also right here, <coughs> we tend to focus a little bit more on that P area or the nitrogen, phosphorus, arsenic. But you can see that this occurs in terms of the different types of tables that you can find it within the textbook. That, you know, here we have, again, that problem area. Here we have ionization energy. 
And right there is the problem that we have. Notice that oxygen should be have a greater ionization energy than nitrogen, than it, but it doesn't according to the trend. And we can say the same thing going down the periodic table to phosphorus, sulfur, arsenic, selenium, and then, yeah, it tends to wash out kind of at that bottom there. We tend to see the trend kind of emerge again. And we can still see that as well in the hard data with um, electron affinities, such as we see, um, you know, here in terms of those degenerate states um, here showing us, you know, that kind of S region where we see a big jump. Notice that some of those are, aren't zero, but here's the comparison that we have with electron affinities, right, is that we'd expect nitrogen to be more negative in its electron affinity than carbon, but it's actually not. And again, that's because of the the idea of that degenerate state and because nitrogen's actually leaving that degenerate state, it's becoming less stable. So it's it's actually harder to do that. These elements are lazy. They don't like to do things, you know, that that they're not, you know, going to get them to a better spot and it's going to be an easy process for them to actually, you know, go through to get to that more stable, uh, you know, level. So if it's not stable, they don't have any desire to, to get there. And so that's what we see on um, this idea of electron affinities with nitrogen and carbon. So for the most part, the trends work out really well and, and no big, uh, uh, is, is really no big deal, but just also trying to highlight some of the areas that we do see some problems occurring. That is all of module three. So we are done with this idea of periodic trends. Um, and now we're going to, to start to get into, um, uh, you know, I don't know. Let's just say that. So that's it for this particular module of looking at periodic trends as well as looking at electronic configurations and orbital um, diagrams. Talk to you soon.